Good evening. My name is Ari Morgan Stern, and I'm the Communications Director for Christians United for Israel. I want to thank you all for taking the time to hear from me this evening. I was asked by KUFI's leadership to speak about the implications of the President's decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and to formally recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Now, there's been a lot discussed about this in the media, but we'd like to offer a different perspective. We'd like to offer perspective beyond what's been discussed in the headlines. We'd like to discuss the implications of the decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and formally recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Now, in my view, the implications of this center around three different groups, in a sense. First and foremost, the Americans. After all, it was the U.S. government that decided to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Secondly, of course, the Israelis, because it is, after all, the U.S. embassy to Israel that was moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And finally, I want to discuss a bit about the Palestinians and how, in Kufai's view, the president's decision to move the U.S. embassy and to formally declare Israel, excuse me, Jerusalem as Israel's capital did a great service to the Palestinian people, despite what some of their advocates and one of their leaders may say. Now, I was deeply honored and privileged with the opportunity to attend the ceremony opening the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. And like the crowd there, like myself, like many of you, I'm sure, at home, here in America, and of course, across Israel, the President's decision was viewed as courageous. It was welcomed. And it is, in my view, the appropriate reaction to what the President did. Now, there are, of course, those who disagree. The President's decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem was not universally welcomed. There were many individuals who argued that moving the embassy would be negative for the Palestinians, that it would cause some great conflagration, some great war. And I won't digress too much into this, but these individuals now cite the riots that occurred along the Gaza border with Israel in the weeks leading up to the movement of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. They cite this as evidence of their prediction coming true. But the reality is that those riots were not some spontaneous reaction to America's decision. Rather, they were an orchestrated and organized effort by Hamas to embed terrorists with rioters and rioters with protesters and to attempt to breach Israel's borders. And then to see that the international community and the international media might condemn Israeli soldiers for defending Israel's borders. Now, I don't want to digress too much into this topic, but I do want to point out that this was not some spontaneous uprising. And in fact, I imagine that if the Palestinian people view this issue in a sense, with a sense and with an eye towards ending conflict, they will see why the president's decision is beneficial to them. You see, the president did not formally declare that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. Jerusalem has been the epicenter of the Jewish people for 3,000 years, and it has been the capital of Israel since the moment the modern state of Israel was founded. He simply formally recognized a truth, a fact. He formally recognized reality. And herein lies the problem for the Palestinian Authority, Hamas, and other Palestinian leaders. You see, the Palestinian narrative, as defined by the Palestinian Authority and many of Israel's detractors, relies on individuals, countries, and the media simply ignoring reality. Allow me to give a few examples. If we accept the Palestinian narrative as defined by Hamas and the PA and others, we have to ignore the fact that Hamas is a terrorist organization. We have to ignore the fact that the Palestinian Authority funds terrorism. We have to simply reject the notion that entities that support violence and terror are not ones with which one can make peace. Moreover, we have to ignore the fact that in contrast to this, Israel is a democratic state, a free state. And of course, we have to ignore and reject the Jewish connection, the ancient Jewish connection to Jerusalem. You see, the Palestinian Authority's narrative relies upon the international community rejecting and ignoring reality. Well, President Trump flipped that on its head. Because for a long time, the international community and governments here in the United States, Republican and Democrat, acquiesced to the PA and Hamas's demand that we ignore reality. 
what the President of the United States did as he sent a very clear message. Gone are the days when the United States will ignore truth. Gone are the days when Palestinian rejectionism will be ignored, when reality will be set aside, when truth doesn't matter. Now, in terms of Jerusalem, we have made a clear message here in the United States. We have delivered a clear message. Truth matters. History matters. And the Palestinian narrative is built on a house of cards that requires individuals to ignore reality. And that is simply unacceptable. So why does this benefit the Palestinian people, you might ask? Because the Palestinian people are being spoon-fed fantasies, a very dark fantasy, wherein Israel can be destroyed through bombs or through terrorism or through boycotts or through international demonization. That, re that narrative, that lie, those lies, prolong the conflict. That's not good for Palestinians. That's not good for Israelis. And frankly, that's not good for anyone who would seek to see the bloodshed and violence in the region end. President Trump undermined the lies told by the Palestinian Authority concerning Jerusalem. And they likely see that as a first step towards undermining, towards rejecting Palestinian demands that we ignore reality. The only way that peace can be achieved, it doesn't have to be between allies. Peace is not achieved between allies. It is achieved between adversaries. You can sit down at the table with an adversary, but we all have to be living in the same world. We all have to be accepting historical truths. We all have to accept reality. I want to typify this point with something that the Prime Minister of Israel and other leaders have been doing for quite some time. They've been asking the Palestinians to simply accept Israel's right to exist and the fact that Israel is a Jewish state, a Jewish and democratic state. This is the truth. This is a fact. I've been there many times. And anyone who's been there can attest to the fact that Israel is, in fact, a Jewish and democratic state. Now, whether or not PA leader Mahmoud Abbas or Hamas accepts Israel as a Jewish state, it won't really affect whether or not Israel's Jewish character remains. But what it will do it will, it will, is that it will indicate that the Palestinians, and the Palestinian leadership in particular, has finally decided to return to the realm of reality, has finally decided that requiring the world to ignore facts on the ground, requiring the world to acquiesce to the idea that truth doesn't matter, simply will not work. It is a first step in the Palestinians accepting certain basic truths, chief among them in this context, that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It will continue to be the capital of Israel. And the flag of Israel will fly over the city of Jerusalem, regardless of what efforts are made to undermine Israel, the, the Jewish connection to that holy city. So when we bring the Palestinian leadership into the knowledge, when we help them see the knowledge, that lies will no longer work, and that reality is the only way that they are going to be able to move forward. That benefits the Palestinian people because the narrative that they've been spoon-fed, the false narrative that they've been spoon-fed, is undermined and the house of cards begins to fall. Now, I've done something here that uh, many journalists have done, many commentators have done, and, and I perfectly, completely admit to falling into the trap. The United States moved its embassy to Israel, uh, moved its embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Yet, I chose in this broadcast to first and foremost talk about the Palestinians. Now, I did this because I wanted to set the stage for the rest of the discussion, but if anyone reads the media, it's interesting to note that oftentimes what this decision meant, or what any decision means for the Americans, or what any decision means for the Israelis takes a back seat to what it means for the Palestinians. Now again, I admit that I fell into this trap as well, but I did want to set the stage <clears throat> excuse me, for the rest of the discussion. So let's talk, let's do justice to the entire topic. Let's talk about the implications, not just for the Palestinians, but for the Israelis and for the Americans. And I'd like to start with the Israelis because it's deeply personal to me, of course. And I believe that if we look at it from more than just a geostrategic perspective, if we look at this entire issue from a moral perspective, from a righteous perspective, then we will be able to 
see more clearly what the broader implications of President Trump's courageous decision concerning Jerusalem really are. And I want to tell a story to kind of typify the point. You see, when I was a young man and my first job out of college, I worked for the Israeli embassy in Washington. I was very honored and very privileged to, to get that job. I was a junior staffer by, by, by any measure, uh, and I was a press officer there at the Israeli embassy. And most of my tasks were associated with uh, what one might think of when uh, uh, someone fresh out of college comes to work at a place like the Israeli embassy. But from time to time, I was uh, given an opportunity to do work that, in its own small way, I believe really contributed to something great. Uh, and one of those moments was when I was tasked with writing the U.S., uh, excuse me, the Israeli Embassy's statement in the U.S. concerning the 40th anniversary of German-Israeli relations. Now, I said this was deeply personal to me because, of course, uh, like many Jewish families, the Holocaust touched my family directly. My great-grandfather uh, was murdered at Auschwitz. So to be tasked by the modern Israeli government to have an opportunity to write about German-Israel relations was deeply meaningful to me. So I poured my heart and soul into this very brief statement. I spent a lot of time on it. I worked very hard uh, because I believed it was very important. And it was passed to, to a few of the senior diplomats, and they reviewed it. And one diplomat, he, he redlined one particular portion of that, of that statement. You see, I had written that the State of Israel thanks America, Germany, and all of our other allies for their steadfast support of our nation. The only portion that the diplomat redlined was the line, all of our other allies. And he was a really nice guy. He didn't owe me an explanation, but he sat me down. He talked with me a little bit about it. And he said, well, what do you mean by all of our other allies? And I said, well, look, Canada, Australia, the UK, Micronesia, there are nations in South America, Africa. But the truth is I couldn't come up with a terribly extensive list. And his point was that while factually my statement might have been accurate, there isn't some deep bench or deep well of international support for Israel in the world. So he had to take that out. Now, why do I tell this story. You know, we've talked about in the past how if you're sitting with your family in a bomb shelter as the rockets are falling, that's a lonely moment in your life. But what we sometimes fail to remember is that that loneliness extends well beyond that moment in the bomb shelter. It extends even so far as to the mindset of a diplomat, a senior diplomat at the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C., Sometimes, when you see the UN treating Israel as it does, being an Israeli can be a very lonely proposition. So one of the implications of President Trump's decision to treat Israel as every other nation deserves to be treated, not in any kind of special way, but to treat Israel as every nation deserves to be treated by granting the Israelis the courtesy of knowing, uh, the courtesy, excuse me, of declaring where their capital will be and then acknowledging that capital, Jerusalem, I believe that that made the world a little bit less of a lonely place for many Israelis. Now, I grant you that this type of commentary or analysis is not going to land me on Fox News or the Washington Post or in the New York Times, but I think that comforting the people of Israel, I think that that has value. I think that that has merit. I think that's an implication that doesn't get discussed of the president's decision, but I think it's an implication worth considering and worth bearing in mind. I have many family, much family and many friends in Israel, and not a single one of them told me that they felt more lonely as a result of the president's decision, quite the opposite. It's something, something valuable, something worth considering, something of merit, when the president of the United States and the strongest, freest nation on earth makes a decision to treat you, an ally, fairly, and like every other nation on earth, is traditionally treated. So there are many other implications for Israel, but I feel that's the one that's not always discussed. The personal story, the individual story, what it meant for the individual average Israeli to know that finally, after 70 years, the leaders of the free world are going to treat, we're going to treat the nation of Israel as all other nations are treated. Now, finally, uh, and to say last but not least is a bit cliche, I want to talk about the implications of the president's decision for the United States. There are two th 
strains here that I want to kind of discuss, two streams of thought that I want to discuss. First, uh, Mrs. Hagee, Miss Diana Hagee, uh, who is the co-executive director of Christians United for Israel and is, of course, married to our founder and chairman, Pastor John Hagee, she has said to me on more than one occasion that it's never wrong to do the right thing. It's a very simple, direct, and I think important concept. So while strat geopolitical strategists and foreign policy experts and the op-ed world and the pundits and such, they'll talk about this decision in terms of geopolitical strategy and foreign policy in a more grand sense, if you will. Excuse me. What they fail to sometimes recognize is that what President Trump did was right and righteous. And as Ms. Hagee says, it's never wrong to do the right thing. I believe that America is an exceptional nation, that we are a great nation. And I believe that exceptionalism is often best exemplified when we choose not what is politically expedient, not what is expected of us by the United Nations or others. I believe that Part of our exceptionalism comes from the fact that we think about morality in our foreign policy. We think about what is the right thing. And though we are by no means perfect, no, nothing created by man is going to be, we strive for good and righteousness. And what the president did concerning Jerusalem was good and righteous. It was historically appropriate. And it was, in effect, treating our ally Israel appropriately, correctly, doing right by a dear friend and ally, Israel. Now, I said there were two kind of streams of thought here that I wanted to discuss in terms of the implication uh, of the president's decision, and the other does concern geopolitics. You see, I, I believe since the founding of this country, and, and certainly well before in terms of political theory, there's a simple concept. Your enemies should fear you. Your friends should trust you. And what the President of the United States did by doing right by Israel strengthened America's foreign policy position in the world because he said in his declaration, and as a result of this declaration, he showed that, that Israel, America's ally, will be treated well, will be treated appropriately, will be treated like every other nation on earth, will be granted the courtesy that all nations deserve and in doing so, he sent a message not to just Israelis, not just to Palestinians, but to every country in the world. The United States stands by its allies. That empowers us. That strengthens us. That strengthens our position in the world. That is in the national security interests of the United States. So for those pundits and commentators who don't know or don't believe that we should allow morality to uh, be a part of our foreign policy decision making, if they come to it from a cold, hard, geopolitical perspective. I don't think there's any denying that sending a clear and unequivocal message to the world that the United States stands with its allies, especially an ally as close as Israel, means that other allies can trust us to stand with them. And conversely, our enemies, they need to fear us. They need to understand that the United States does not tolerate those who would ask us to behave immorally. The United States does not tolerate lies. The United States does not tolerate those who would ask us to acquiesce to the idea that we should ignore reality. So I've discussed in this context three very underreported, underdiscussed, if you will, implications of the president's decision to move the U.S. Embassy uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. There are many other topics and many other implications that we should discuss, and we could discuss. But I feel these are the things that people don't often think about. What the president did is he moved the ball forward in terms of bringing some sort of uh, reality into the minds of the Palestinian leadership. He shattered this idea that the international community would acquiesce at every turn to whatever Palestinian demand was made, no matter how far from the truth it was. He sent a message to the Israelis that the United States does seek to comfort the people of Israel, does seek to treat them as an, every nation on earth should be treated. And he sent a message to the world that we will engage as Americans in a moral foreign policy, that we will stand with our allies. Now, in conclusion, and, and I don't want you to get me wrong, I'm not one to try to, uh, 
to plug a book or a plug an event or anything like that, but it is June and it is important that we uh, come to a point uh, where we're discussing what's taking place in just a few weeks and that's the Christians United for Israel Washington Summit. It takes place in Washington on July 23rd and 24th. And I want to discuss with you not just, you know, the traditional why you might want to attend from a grand perspective, but why each individual watching this at home, I believe, will greatly feel blessed and benefited to have had the opportunity to attend the summit. First, as many of you, I'm sure, know, Ambassador Nikki Haley will be speaking. I believe Senator Tom Cotton will be speaking. You'll get to hear from really impressive and great leaders. Pastor John Hagee, of course, will be speaking, and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, as he has always done, I believe, will be speaking live via satellite at the summit. So you'll get to hear from many, many great leaders, uh, many, many individuals that I believe will help all those interested in understanding what's taking place in the region have a clearer picture of it. But the second day of the summit, for me personally, is is the moment that's most humbling and I believe is something that uh, we should discuss just a moment, just for a moment this evening. You see, in this country, we are blessed with a very unique opportunity. We can disagree. We don't have to vote for a politician in order to have a conversation with them. We can disagree with them and we can have a conversation with them about the things we believe in. And that is an incredible freedom that not everybody, not everybody in this world enjoys. And in America, we have that freedom. And I've, over the years, gotten to know many congressional staffers and a few politicians, a few elected officials. And it's not terribly popular to say it, but I assure you, these are very hardworking individuals. And there's not enough hours in the day to achieve what they want to achieve. But I think one of the best ways, in fact, I know one of the best ways to communicate with our elected officials is to go there and sit before them and say what you have to say. They may not agree with you, but I assure you they will hear you. They will stop what they're doing, and they will hear what you have to say. And they will recognize that you came from Indiana and Alabama and California and all across this country for the sole purpose of ensuring that your elected representatives represent your beliefs. Now, if you're watching this at home, it means that you have a strong, I believe, conviction, and that you believe that the U.S.-Israel relationship is worth protecting and preserving and defending. So I encourage you, if you're able, to take the opportunity to come to Washington and exercise that God-given right, that inalienable right, and that right that has been protected and defended by the bravest and best among us, to sit across the table from your elected officials and their representatives and communicate with them exactly how you feel about the U.S.-Israel relationship and exactly why you feel that if they're going to be in Washington representing your views, the best way they can do that is by standing with Israel. Again, I want to thank you as I did for taking the time to hear what I had to say this evening, for joining us. Of course, to thank you all very much for supporting Israel, for standing with Christians United for Israel. I sincerely hope that uh, I will see you in Washington in just a few weeks. Uh, and in the meantime, thank you again for watching. God bless you all. And please have a good night.